everyone. Welcome to another live session at The Reactors. Um, my name is Rav and I'm the, pro um, I'm the Program Manager at Reactor London. Before we begin, please take a moment to read our Code of Conduct. We're all here to learn, so please be mindful and respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, and please be kind and considerate in the way you engage. Um, the chat will be open throughout, and we do encourage you all to participate. Today's session is on deploying machine learning models on Kubernetes. And our speaker for today is Ed Shi. He is the head of developer relations at Selden. And he's also very passionate about MLOps. He also runs a user group um, called MLOps, which I will share the link to it in the chats. Uh, and with that, I'm now going to hand it over to Ed. Hi, Ed. Hey, Rav. Uh, thank, thank you for having me. And yeah, hello, everyone on the stream. Um, yeah, it's good, good to be here. So excited to talk about ML on Cube and, uh, and all the greatness that, that comes with that and, well, and the challenges too, right? So, awesome. Um, cool. Awesome. What I'll do is I'll throw my slides up and then we'll get going. You just let me know that you can definitely see that. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was going to say, <laughs> your slides are up, Ed. And if you uh, need cool. anything, just shout. Um, I'll be in the background. Okay, great. I'll, uh, I'll take it away then. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thanks for the intro from Rav. Um, as uh, you know, as we said, I'm Ed Shi. I'm head of developer relations at Selden. Um, what that means is I do a bit of everything. It's like you know, product management, engineering, marketing, all kind of rolled into one. But I'd say my the main goal of my job is to to help improve developer experience. So. You know, whether that's through like code samples, tutorials, uh, product improvements, whatever it is, right? Developer experience is, is my, my passion. Um, uh, I, I also, yeah, I run the MLOps London meetup. So uh, if you're interested in MLOps or production machine learning, um, you know, please do have a look at that and, and come along to some of the meetups. Um, I'm also an organizer of Tech Ethics London um, and a board member of the AI Infrastructure Alliance. Um, so I have a, a lot of spinning plates. I uh, like to keep myself busy even when I'm not at work. Um, so yeah, today I was going to talk about um, deploying ML models on Kubernetes, right? Uh, a a non-trivial problem. Um, and I've kind of titled this MLOps at scale as well, because I think the reason you, you deploy stuff to Kubernetes is normally because you're trying to scale. Um, I'll start with a bit of background, right? And this is definitely from what I've seen, um, that data scientists are now really, really good at ML. They, you know, they're good at using popular libraries like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-learn, XGBoost, et cetera, by right? building good models um, that maybe are quite accurate. And they're, they're sort of getting better at it. So the code sample I've put in here just saves a bunch of models to disk. So it's probably a bad example, but um, what I'm implying here is that actually data scientists are getting better at versioning and tracking and exporting their work. Uh, still not great, um, but there's definitely you know, a lot of progress in there, and, and people tend to be using things like MLflow and so on a lot more now to, to track experiments and, and version data and so on. Um, but that's like more or less it, right? Knowing what to do next in terms of I've built a model, how do I actually get some value out of it and get it into production? Uh, that tends to be where there's a big gap, right? And, um, and that's yeah, that's, that's to be expected, right? Data scientists are generally like experimental um, type work. Uh, they often come from academia. They don't have the rigorous software engineering disciplines that are required for uh, production workloads. Um, so what, what usually happens is you'll say, okay, I've got a model, I've trained it. Now I, I, I want to kind of make predictions on the fly. So let's wrap it in a Flask API. Right, that's probably the easiest way. It's Python. I'm familiar with it. Um, I can, you know, like this code sample here, just build a quick route, and then I can send HTTP requests, and brilliant, I get predictions back. There are a lot of challenges to be solved though by by doing that. Um, what what I'm not saying here is that you shouldn't do this. Right? There, there are tons of use cases where you should just, you know, build a fast API, get it out there quickly, you know, put it on a pads, um, even you know, host stuff on lambda or functions or whatever um but you will come into to challenges right and and here are some of them 
So typically your workloads aren't always just going to be simple, you know, request response type stuff. Cool. Um, yes, you'll have the kind of online inference that needs doing, but um, there'll be tons of batch jobs as well. Uh, if you look at, you know, particularly in things like retail where machine learning is used to predict um, the, you know, the types of products that are going to be interesting to people. So, you know, recommender systems, those often get run in huge batches overnight so that, you know, every user when they log in in the morning has personalized recommendations for them. Um, you, you also have to, have to handle things like streaming data. You know, if, if I'm doing object detection on video feeds, um, that needs to be near real time. And I might have you know, hundreds of frames per second that I need to be analyzing. Um, so there are complex challenges there. Um, on top of that, right, machine learning models are actually like, pretty big. Uh, and some of the state of the art stuff, you know, like the you know, GPT, uh, some of the transformers you can get from Hugging Face, often the models themselves are you know, tens or hundreds of gigabytes. Um, it's not as simple as you know, a traditional app deployment. You have to think about how you're going to handle that model, pull it down into containers or VMs or wherever you are. you're hosting it, um, store that, um, and version it as well. And then typically the requests that come in uh, are not in the format that you need to be able to run a prediction. So um, you, know, you need to do pre-processing and post-processing for for machine learning, that might be things like you know converting text into word embeddings, um, which, if you're not familiar, are like numerical representations of the words that allow you to then run machine learning models on them underneath, right? And then if you're generating text on the other side of it, you need some post-processing to take those numbers that come out of your machine learning model and convert them back into text. Um, so you need to do those. Um, and then if everyone's building their own API in something like Flask, you have the issue of standardizing those API definitions and then defining what do those payload structures look like. Um, you know, for one model, it might be totally different to another. Um, another thing you're going to have challenges with, and this is probably one of the biggest ones, is actually, great, I've got my model into production. It's running there. How on earth do I roll out a new model, uh, a new version to it, validate it, check that it's better than the previous one, um, you know, do techniques like canaries, et cetera. Um, all, all of that you need to think about. And then finally, you know, scaling components independently. Right? If I put everything into one app and just roll it out, then I can only scale that app. Uh, and it might not even be inherently scalable. Um, in, in a lot of cases, you know, maybe you're receiving to your machine learning model. Let's, let's assume it's quite a compute intensive model. And you, you know, maybe it takes like, 30 seconds to make a prediction. But actually what you're seeing is that you have tons of the same requests coming through. So caching responses and returning them immediately might be a really um, good way to both reduce your cloud costs, but also improve the user experience by getting predictions to people quicker. Um, the good news is that like many of these challenges are not new, right? They're, they're things that DevOps has been dealing with for you know, decades now. Um, and a lot of the best practices that have come out of DevOps can be used to tackle these. Um, so, the, so the one that we at Selwyn uh, you know, think really tackles most of these is Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has been become pretty much the like um, you know standardized platform of choice for cloud containerization workloads. But that's a sounds like a mouthful. But basically, if you want to run containers anywhere at scale people are using Kubernetes now. Um, and that's because it's a really good tool. It does a ton of things that you need for production workloads, like you know, automatically um, checking the health of your containers and then restarting them if they crash, uh, distributing the workloads across multiple machines so that if a machine falls over, you've still got availability, uh, you know, collecting metrics into a centralized location. All of those kind of things are taken care of for you by using Kubernetes. Um, so what we did at Selwyn was we built um, a library called Selwyn Core. Uh, it's fully open source. And basically what it does in the sort of simplest TLDR format is it deploys and monitors machine learning models on Kubernetes. So it takes you know, your finished and trained model that you've saved somewhere, um, builds it into a container, deploys it on a highly optimized 
inference server and then schedules that across a Kubernetes cluster to run and execute uh, requests, which could be you know, REST requests or it also supports gRPC. Um, but it wraps this into a containerized microservice. It also has a ton of like cool features on top. Um, I'm going to show some of them today. Uh, I'll, I'll brush over a few others and, and you know, we can do more about them in the questions if people are interested. Um, one of the things I really like is that you can define these inference graphs. Um, and I'll show that uh, in a slide in a bit because it's kind of easier to explain with some graphics. Um, but uh, what I think, like in the simplest terms, an inference graph is a way to combine different machine learning models. Um, often your application isn't as simple as just, you know, send a request, predict something, and send it back. Uh, it might be that, you know, first you want to do one run one classifier. Um, and if I think of an example of this, right, let's say I want to find out the type of transport vehicle. So the first classifier that I want to send my request to might just identify, is it a car, is it a bus, is it a van, is it a bicycle, et cetera. And then it, if it notices, okay, it's really accurate, it says it's a bicycle, we're pretty confident. Now let's send that request onto the bicycle classifier, which classifies different types of bicycles. Um, and that way I can build this kind of ensemble of machine learning models that will give you the response you're looking for, which is, you know, it is this make and model of bike um, without having to train a single model on thousands and thousands of classes. So there are lots of those kind of use cases and, and, and they're supported within this inference graph. Um, okay, so uh, the way Selden Core works is it's um, configuration driven. Um, so here's a, an example of a simple deployment and uh, it, it's all written in YAML, so sorry if you hate YAML, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's a good way of writing config and it's human readable at least. And, and I'll walk you through the important bits in here. Um, so you know, the first part is just capturing you know, metadata on there. Um, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, this, this will, will look really like, comfortable and at home to you um, because it's essentially just like writing you know, any other Kubernetes object. Um, you specify your metadata, and then the important parts for your machine learning model that seldom then pick up on are the implementation tag in there. So that one, um, what, what you're doing there is you're defining what type of model is this? Is it a PyTorch, you know, TensorFlow, um, you know, scikit-learn as in this example it is. Um, what that does is it's telling seldom core, okay, that's the type of machine learning model I need to run. And under the covers, Selden's going to go and pull in the right optimized inference server for that framework. Um, so you know, if it's PyTorch, it's going to go and pull down the right server with all the dependencies to run a PyTorch model for you in a highly optimized and distributed environment. Um, the, the next thing that's important here is this model URI. And that's essentially just saying, like, hey, where is that model that you want to deploy? Um, typically, that's a, you know, a storage bucket, like an you know, S3 endpoint or Google storage or whatever. Um, sometimes it might be you know, file storage or um, network storage. Uh, and then you know, finally, something you might want to specify on everything is the number of replicas. Um, that, you can actually set up auto scaling. Um, we'll come on to that, I think, in a little bit. Um, but you know, you can also just manually define. I want you know fifteen replicas in my model, right? And and again, that's the nice thing about Kubernetes is it will schedule those all across your different nodes in the cluster. Okay, so I'm going to do a bit of a live demo because I think it's always a bit more interesting than just speaking at people. Um, cool. Oh, hang on. Let me kill my Slack. Don't want any more notifications coming through. Um, cool. So the first thing I'm going to do is I've got this model in here. Um, and as you can see, that looks a bit like my um, you know, my previous deployment here, right? It's a simple deployment. In fact, this, this might be the exact same one. Um, it's what we're deploying here is this Iris model. It's a, if, if you've built and trained machine learning models before, you've almost certainly used scikit-learn, and you've probably used the Iris classifier. It's a, you know, a very common data set and very common model that's used as like a hello world example. Um, as you can see, I've specified my implementation as the scikit learn server, and I've given it a link to where this saved model artifact is stored, right? And then what I can do, 
is I can just do as I would with any other Kubernetes object. Um, I will just apply that to a cluster. So like virus, yeah. Okay, so I've now created that. And if you look in my, so I'm just deploying that into my default namespace. Um, but if we look in there, let's do get, uh, firstly, let's do get Selden deployment. Okay, you can see I've created this object called a Selden deployment. Um, but underneath, yeah. if I do you know, get pods, right, you can see it's, it's creating the pods underneath with the containers in them to actually um, serve that model. And it's made up of, uh, sorry, I'm terrible at typing and speaking at the same time. Shouldn't have signed up for this gig, should I? Um, okay, so QCSL gets deployments. You can see it's created this deployment called my Iris model default classifier. Um, and if I go get services, maybe that instead. Um, you can see it's created services in there as well. So the combination of Selden Core and Kubernetes has automatically taken that model, built it into a container inside a pod, uh, running in a deployment on Kubernetes, and created the services I need over the top to route traffic to that model. Um, and then if we just check how's that, how that is getting on. So, okay, so it's all running. Let's clear this. And then what we're going to do is I'm actually going to, okay. Let's do a curl to that. So um, I've just copied and pasted this in because um, it's a bit of a mouthful to type out or handful, keyboardful. I don't know what the right term is. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm sending a simple post request over HTTP to a local host, which is where my cluster is running. So this Kubernetes cluster is actually running on my physical machine here in the room. Um, and then this endpoint seldom defines uh, that it's going to my uh, you know, seldom call deployment on there. This is my namespace. This is the name of the model. And then I have API version and the predictions, right? And, and the data that I'm going to send in this case is the numerical data that's required to make a prediction. Uh, and if I send that, oh, that's a bit, hang on, let's make that a bit more readable. OK, cool. And you can see the response I get back, this one down here, um, is this ND array, and I've got my actual predictions in there. So this is predicting that it is 99% certain that it is class three. And actually, the, what the iris model does is, it is uh, there are three different types of iris flower, uh, and dependent on categories like the petal length, the petal width, uh, and the petal depth, I think. I can't remember what all the, the features are. Um, it, it can very accurately tell you which type of iris you have, um, just based on a few measurements. And, and that's basically what this example code is doing in there. Um, so we're getting my prediction back. So there you go. You can see how easy it is just to take a simple model, uh, put it up there, and then make requests to it. And that's now a you know, highly scalable API running on my Kube cluster that I can, you know, I can scale up, scale down, I can add metrics, um, you know, logging, et cetera, to everything. Um, what I want to show you now is maybe a, a slightly more advanced example, which is, if I just come back in here, uh, this is probably easiest for me to run in a Jupyter notebook, so hopefully you guys can see this all right. Um, let's make it bigger again. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new namespace in my Kubernetes cluster, uh, and then let's just set the config so that I'm in there. Uh, so if I go back up here, uh, oops, sorry, you just tell get namespace. Okay. You can see I have a bunch of different namespaces, and I've just created this new one called Selden um, 14 seconds ago. Uh, the reason that's important is just I can I can then run my deployment in there, and I can isolate it and delete it afterwards if I need to. Um, okay, and then I'm just going to run a few cells just so that we get ahead of ourselves and the deployment doesn't take too long, and then I'll come back to them. So, okay, cool. Um, all right, what I've done there is the first thing I've done is just set a bunch of variables. So, like, uh, you know, here's my Istio gateway or my ingress URL that I'm going to connect to. Uh, added some versioning details about the version of the model that I'm going to deploy, um, and then the important thing is I've is I've done this, right? I've created this model.yaml file, 
And in that, you can see, you know, it looks very similar to my one I created earlier, maybe a little bit more verbose because I'm adding slightly more detail to this. Um, but the structure is still the same, right? I have this canary example that I'm deploying. And then inside that, I have a spec. And I can define a full like Kubernetes container spec if I need to. So like this, you know, the image, uh, Seldon.io, mock classifier, and then the version that we're putting from the environment variable. Um, and then what I've done then is I've applied that to my cube cluster. So I've basically created this object up here. Uh, and then I'm just waiting. This is just checking for the rollout status. So waiting for it to, to roll out. And we can see now deployment successfully rolled out. The reason I run that is sometimes it takes a couple of minutes to, to create the deployment and pull down the, the image and then run it. Um, so, okay, so what we have now is we have a, a model running very much like we did earlier with our Iris model. Um, this is just a mock classifier. Um, but we have that model up and running on Kubernetes. Uh, what I'm trying to show with this notebook, however, is, is how do we deal with that problem of Okay, I've got a new version of my model. I want to roll it out, but I don't want to just completely replace my previous one. Maybe I want to do some A-B testing. Um, so I want to roll out the new version, split the traffic, and maybe send like a certain percentage to the new model, and then I can be checking the logs and the metrics. And even better if I have uh, you know, actual feedback on my model and my maybe my users correct predictions if they're wrong. I can then actually use things like accuracy of the model uh, to determine which of the two is the best one and then promote the candidate that's performing the best. Um, so in, in, in our scenario, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just run a quick prediction here. Um, we, uh, what I'm doing here actually is I'm, we have a, a Python client as well that you can make predictions from, so I don't have to just run uh, curl requests every time. Um, and then I make this request against this example model in my cell namespace, and you can see my response that comes back. Um, okay, so I'm getting this data back, it's a tensor, and then the value is you know, 0 0.96, right? And you can see that's come from my mock classifier. So I'm sending these requests, I'm getting responses. Uh, you know, the, the data that's actually going in underneath doesn't really matter too much. Your model could be doing all sorts of things. Um, the important thing is you know, you've got it running on cell and core in a, in a scalable way. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, I've, I've built a new version of the model. Um, what I want to do now is I want to launch that, but I don't want to give all the traffic to it. I don't, and I don't want to replace my previous one either. So I'm going to launch a canary, and I'm going to split the traffic 75% you know, to the main model and 25% to the canary. So uh, what I end up doing is I write this slightly longer um, manifest file. And you can see in here the important bit. So there's a, there's a lot to take in. Um, don't worry too much about this. Um, but the important thing here is that, I guess, this first one, right, which is my uh, canary example, this one is I want traffic 75% to. And then my, oh, where's my other one? OK, yeah. And then my other one, which is in here, will get. 25%, OK? Um, and that one is named Canary. So what should happen if I send, you know, deploy this, actually, let's do that. Oh, what have I done? Oh, I've typed something wrong instead. Uh oh, oh, that is I deleted something by accident. Hopefully that runs now. Cool. And then let's run that. OK, and then let's roll that out. OK, so uh, what you can see here, and again, important piece is highlighted down here. Um, so I'm waiting for that example canary classifier to run, roll out. Um, so I'm going to have a main model that I've already deployed, and I'm now rolling out a second version of it with 25% traffic being sent to it. Um, let's just wait for that to, to roll out. Oh, cool, that was quick. Um, great. So I've now got a main classifier, a canary classifier. Um, and then what I can do is let's send some predictions. Just check that's running. OK, cool. Uh, the easiest way to show this, I think, is to do um, maybe like let's send 100 requests in here. OK, and then and you can see this actually coming in. My, uh, 
Oh, maybe not in here. I was going to say if I write, it's so quick. The problem is particularly is I don't have any latency because it's all running on my local machine. Uh, if I run 100 requests here, you don't even get to see them firing through here into the actual server. But um, you have to trust me on that. And you can see it here, right? What I can do is I will get the count of um, the number of requests that went in. So what I'm doing is I'm looking into the logs of the actual containers here and saying, uh, which of them came from that example app? So this label cell map equals example. Um, I'm looking at those logs and then I'm looking at the same for the example canary, canary rather than the main one. Um, and then I'm making a count of like how many requests were sent to each model. And then so we run that one. And then this piece of code down here is just very simply like working out what's the ratio of requests that went from one to the other. Um, so I'm going to print the, the percentage of requests that were sent to my canary. And then I, I could do something like a test, you know, to assert that it's within a, an acceptable range. And we can see there that 36.4% you know, of my requests were sent to the canary. We asked it for 25 and we're never going to get exactly 25, right? Because it's, it's kind of randomly picking one in four. Um, the, but, you know, if we run it again, Let's run another 100 requests and then add that up. You can see we've got 32% this time. And if I keep running that, my average will be 25%. Um, cool, so I appreciate that was a hell of a lot to take in. Um, I'm gonna rewind a step and go back and just kind of explain some of the, the basics a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, and then I'm actually gonna run that because it's a lot easier to clear up that uh, deployment. Okay, so let's jump back into my slides. Uh, we've done this one, done the demo. Okay, so the other thing I mentioned was this concept of an inference graph. Um, I think the simplest way to show that is, is through this example here. Um, so let's say I want to, you know, I have one machine learning model, I want to take some inputs, predict something, and then I want to feed that predicted output straight into another model. Um, you know, that, you know, might well happen, right? It might be a case of, you know, let's run a, a let's say I'm like approving loans as a bank, right? I want to run some sort of prediction that like calculates a risk score for the user. And then I want to feed that risk score combined with some other financial data, maybe into the actual loan approvals that says, you know, does, should we approve or not approve the loan? Um, then, the way I can do that within Selden Core is I define this graph object. And you can see here, so I have this you know, node one, which is a type model, and then underneath it, I have children. Uh, in this case, I only have one. Um, but what that's saying is that the output of the first one gets fed to the child, um, which is another model. And if you know that's recursive, so I can go all the way down and I can build all these like complex graphs if I need to. Mm. Let me uh, give a slightly more complex example so that you can see how that works. So again, you've got the, the kind of YAML representation of this on the left-hand side. Um, but what I'm doing here is, let's say I have like two models. Um, I'm trying to think of a good, good prediction here. So um, I, let's say I'm dealing with both text data and with numerical data, um, and I want to predict something. So um, actually, let's stick with the banking example and maybe say that in order to approve this loan, because I'm a slightly shady banking company, I actually go and like trawl their Twitter to check that they're not a terrorist or you know some sort of like right wing lunatic that we're going to give the money to. Um, and uh, so what I'm doing is I'm taking inputs as text, which is coming from maybe their Twitter profile or whatever. Um, and because it's text data, I can't just feed that straight into a model. I need some sort of like input transformation to convert that to numbers so that the machine learning model can run against it. So I'll use an input transformer. I'll run the model against that and then the output transformer, which might give me a response back uh, that says, you know, this is or isn't a, you know, someone that we think we should give a loan to. 
And then equally, I might run a bunch of numerical stuff through this other model on the, the right-hand side. Um, and that model is just taking you know, the, I don't know, the credit score, the amount in their account, you know, whether they've, the number of times they've paid off their credit card on time, all those kind of features. And that can make a much more numerical assessment um, and then as a bank, maybe I want to choose to approve that loan based on a combination of those two. Um, so I have a combiner in there with some extra logic that says, do you know what? They might have the best financial record in the world, but if they're tweeting things about Islamic State, then maybe we shouldn't give them a loan or you know, whatever it is, right? Um, I, I actually hope that banks are not checking people's social media before they approve a loan, but you can, you can imagine how some kind of shady banks probably do that kind of stuff. Um, uh, what you'll see is that like the point of that is that these inference graphs can be built up to be as complex as you like, and they can handle all these different machine learning use cases that you might need to run. Um, the other thing to mention is that like by you know, putting things in different parts of a graph, you can scale all these components independently. So maybe you're, you know, in this example, model one takes way longer to run than way model two or requires tons more compute resources and it starts to create a bottleneck we can scale model one and and run more replicas of that so that we can handle more requests and the combiner isn't waiting for the outputs cool um another thing you can do and uh, again you know i'm kind of throwing information at people and hopefully you'll ask loads of questions afterwards um is uh, and this is optional like some people use it some people don't um, but you can add model metadata to all of your requests and onto each deployed model. Um, what do I mean by model metadata? Well, increasingly, like when you train a machine learning model, you deploy it, you start making predictions from it. Um, people are asking the question of like, how can I trace that back to the data that was used to generate it? Like in terms of, you know, for audit or transparency or whatever, um, and you're seeing more and more tools now in the data science world that allow you to version your data, to track all of the experiments that you write, might run, uh, version all of the models that you've built. Um, and, there's, and you get this like lineage all the way from here's the data set to here's the prediction I serve to a customer. Um, and that's really important because then if the customer you know, needs to be audited or there's some you know, uh, kind of legal dispute, you can trace it all the way back and you can say, well, that prediction was made against this version of this model running at this time um, and in this format. And that was, you know, that version of that model was trained on this type of data with, you know, these kind of configuration parameters. Um, and so you can kind of trace the whole thing back. Um, and that's, I think that's really important, again, particularly in heavily regulated industries, that's becoming more and more of like uh, a mandated approach. Um, so what Seldom does is it allows you to deploy that metadata alongside your model. Um, it could be just for querying, so that you just want to say, like, you know, I want to go and get the metadata for this model. Um, but it also might be that actually for every response you get back, you also want some of that lineage, um, you know, and, and like important metadata. So the, I don't know if, oh, okay, I've, I've actually talked through my points. Um, but uh, yeah, one final thing, I guess, is to capture the input and output schemas. Uh, you know, every machine learning model receives like different formats of data um, and expects it in a certain type and might output it in certain different types too. Um, so being able to attach that to the actual model server so that an application developer can just query the metadata endpoint and say, oh, look, yeah, okay, that's the type of um, data it's expecting. A little bit like an, you know, an API definition that you might go and read in when you read the API docs or you know Swagger file or whatever, um, because it's built into Kubernetes, it allows you to to do all sorts of automated metrics. Um, Selden Core by default will collect all the metrics and uh, send them to Prometheus if you have it running on your server. Um, and then we have Grafana dashboards that you can deploy um, in order to monitor for you know, not not just all your like typical infrastructure level metrics. So yes, you get you know, your, your response rates, your um, CPU, memory usage, all that kind of stuff. Um, but for machine learning, there's, there might be a whole load of more things you want to monitor. 
Um, and so we can you can build custom metrics within Sullivan Core that get logged alongside every um, every model. Um, and another thing, so this is a, a whole like another topic, but actually incredibly important, is that when you deploy a model to production, um, you can't just leave it. It's not like a piece of application code where if it runs, it runs, right? Um, they, we use machine learning to, to draw correlations between data and you know, outputs. And often these affect real world things. And in the real world, nothing stays the same. So typically machine learning models degrade over time. Um, the way that we monitor for these is a technique called drift detection. Um, and I'll try and explain that. Th these charts kind of show you uh, the different types of drift that you can uh, come across. So if we take that, the box on the left-hand side, right? let's assume this is our training data. So there's a you know, decision boundary that's been drawn by our machine learning model. And you know, everything that's blue is one class, and everything that's um, yellow is another, or orange, or whatever color appears to you. Um, the, the ways in which the distribution might drift over time. So the first one, um, covariate drift, and this is like often known as input drift, is that the actual features that are being fed into your model, the statistical distribution of that has changed. Um, so I don't know if I've got a good, good example of that, um, you know, maybe for like, um, voting, right? You've built a classifier that tries to tell you how well, you know, which political party people are going to vote for. Um, and actually an example of input drift is that more and more young people are voting. So, you know, with age being one of the features of your classifier, um, if tons of young people vote and all the old people stop voting, your classifier is incorrect now because it assumed a sample of the population that was across all ages. Um, the second type of drift you might accomplish is prior drift. And this is uh, like drift on the actual predictions itself. Um, so maybe the input data hasn't changed, but the classifier is now predicting way more of one type than another. And that um, is, is like outside the norm of what we'd expect given the, you know, the reference distribution. Um, and then the third type is concept drift. And this is, is probably the most dangerous one, right? Because it's harder to spot, um, but it's also probably the most common that comes up. And what concept drift is, is where the, the actual underlying correlation between the inputs and the outputs of your machine learning model have changed in some way nearly always due to like real world factors. So um, I use the example of uh, you know, like a house price prediction model. So let's say you've built this really clever machine learning model. You can give it all the inputs, number of rooms, the size of the house, where it is, et cetera. Um, and it tells you very accurately how much your house is going to be worth. Um, and then if you, you know, we get to the beginning of 2020 and a pandemic hits the world. Right, and everyone goes into lockdown. They're all working from home. Suddenly, people aren't interested in buying, you know, inner city flats with one bedroom. Um, people want outdoor space. They want balconies. They want spare bedrooms so they can use them as offices. All of those things have shifted the way that people value houses. But because we trained our model before the pandemic, it's still telling us that this, you know, pokey one bedroom flat in central London should be worth a fortune when actually, you know, that's the, the owners of it are really struggling to sell it. Um, so that's an example of concept drift. And, and, and that's why you have to monitor these models. Um, the way we do at Selvin is, is we built this Python library again, fully open source called Alibi. Um, and that uh, has lots of different algorithms in it for drift detection. Um, and it's also, you can deploy those on top of Selvin core alongside your models. So when I mentioned, you know, monitoring back here in terms of like infrastructure, yes, that's important because you don't want your production models to fall over. Um, but equally important is to actually monitor the, the drift of the data that's coming in and out of those models to make sure that you're not sending you know, inaccurate responses back to people. Um, the, the final thing we're, we're seeing, you know, become more and more important is the ability to deploy 
explainers or some sort of interpretable um, algorithm alongside your machine learning model. Um, it's all very well, you know, just training a black box and having it spit out predictions. Um, but increasingly, people want to know, well, why did it make that prediction? Um, so we, again, in our Alibi library, we've, we've built all these explainability algorithms. Um, it can be used as a standalone Python library um, or, again, deployed on top of your models with Selden Core. Um, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of explainability. So um, if we take this image of the, the dog here, right, what we really want to do is we want to understand what's one of the most important parts of that image that um, contributed to the classification of it as a beagle. Um, and, and this is a technique called anchors, where you basically select some of the, the pixels and then you try and superimpose them over other images and run them through the classifier. Um, and if you do that enough times, you get a pretty good feel for uh, you know, how the make, what certain pixels and the makeup of the image that's actually driving a prediction. Um, so in this one, we can see that you know, the anchor for that beagle is actually is pretty accurate, right? It's the face, it's the colorings, the marking, the back. Um, and that if you look on the rock, top right hand side, if you superimpose that anchor on top of pretty much any other image, it still predicts over 90% of them to be beagles. Um, so, so we're pretty confident that that anchor is important. Um, this is a, is a really important technique because often you find that people have trained classifiers that appear to work, but actually don't have any useful logic behind them. So if the example here was a husky, right, it is, um, sure, it might accurately get pictures of huskies right, but if you look at the anchors, you might find that the most important driving factor in it classifying a dog as a husky is whether it sees snow in the background. And because you know all of the images that we trained it on with huskies have snow in the background. So actually, if you you know you had a husky sitting on a sofa, it might totally misclassify it as a, as a different dog. Um, and another technique um, that you might want to use within explainability is uh, something called counterfactuals. And, and what we're doing here is we're really saying, what is the kind of minimum difference I need to make in my request in order to get a different response from the classifier? So uh, if you look at the images down the bottom, these numbers, so across the top, we've got 0, 2, 5, 4, 8, right? Um, and that's what the original image that was fed in and the, the you know, classifiers come back with that response. And that looks pretty accurate. I mean. To be honest, this four, four could be anything. I don't know who writes a four like that. Um, but what um, a counterfactual technique will do is we'll say, what is the, you know, the minimum number of pixels that I need to change to black on that original image before I get a totally different class up here? So you can see for the zero, right, if I, the bottom left-hand side, if I kind of remove a few of the pixels there very quickly, the classifier starts to identify it as a seven. Um, equally, you know, for the two, if I kind of smudge out a bit of the, the loop in it, it starts to look like a zero um, and so on and so forth. In fact, probably that four is the easiest one, right? We just add a couple of white pixels at the top and suddenly we've got a nine. Um, so there are all sorts of different techniques and it, it sort of depends on the what you're trying to explain, whether it's an individual prediction or whether you're trying to explain the model as a whole. Um, and it also depends on the, the data type and the, the type of model that you have as well. Um, so you know the techniques that are used for images are slightly different than those used for text, uh, which again are different from those used for you know, tabular or numerical data. Um, but it, again, a, you know, really important, um, definitely you know, increasingly hot topic in the machine learning world is yeah, how do we deploy these explainers alongside? Uh, and the great thing is, you know, you can you can spin those up alongside your model within uh, cell and core. So you know, it's it's all just running inside your Kubernetes cluster for you. Uh, there's a ton more uh, to go through, but I'll just go through this very quickly, and then we can do some questions. Mm. Um, so I mentioned auto scaling already. I think you know, by nature of being part of Kubernetes. Um, cluster, you can also scale every component if needed. Um, we've also built custom language wrappers. 
Um, so we appreciate that not everyone just trains a you know a TensorFlow or a PyTorch model, and uh, that even if they do, they might have you know, a bunch of custom logic that they've implemented inside their model. Um, the reason we then built a language wrapper is you can incorporate that into your model, deploy it alongside um, your model, and uh, we'll treat it as though it were you know a your original TensorFlow model or whatever. Um, the we have the ability to do full request logging. So again, you know, what were the inputs? What were the outputs from every single prediction? Um, yeah, that integrates with Elasticsearch. Um, so again, it gives you the audibility and traceability across all your requests. Um, you can do tracing, and again, like a lot of this is the benefit of using you know the best practices of DevOps, right? Um, you know, initiatives like the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, and the projects that they have been incubating have allowed us to do loads of these cool things on top of Kubernetes. And, and what we've done, and the team at Selden Core, is we've just integrated those into our product. So for example, you know, distributed tracing, um, you know, done through like open tracing and Jaeger, um, that allows you to track the latency across all the networks, hops, uh, across the different microservices, um, which is really, really important when you might be like, you know, troubleshooting why am I getting a really slow response time? You know, is it actually the model that takes ages and tons of CPU to, to process? Or actually, is there some sort of network bottleneck that's happening inside my cluster or elsewhere? Um, the, you know, the beauty of, of the tracing is that you can see every single hop and break that down. Um, and then integrations to things like Kafka, Knative, the stream processing. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, you know, particularly for like having video feeds and audio feeds and doing real-time predictions, uh, stream processing could be really important. Um, and then the batch processing, you know, we built a, a CLI that allows you to fire huge batches at, at the cluster and, and have it scale out and um, kind of opt optimizes that across as many like horizontal nodes as it can um, in order to get your batch jobs done efficiently. Um, so yeah, there's, there's tons of stuff there. I, I don't. I could spend forever going through it and show like a hundred different demos, um, but I think I've already bombarded you all with like way too much information. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll hand over and we can do some questions. Um, and and if you don't get your question answered now, you know, please you know ping me on LinkedIn or uh, send me an email or whatever. Um, great, thanks, Ed. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. So what I'll do is um, you can stop sharing your screen okay. and I will just add this on so you can see the questions. Uh, so we have the first questions from Lucas. Um, is there a Helm chart for Selden Core? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, yeah, good question. I, I didn't cover any of the installation at all, um, but yes, we, we have a Helm chart um, that's typically how I'd say like 90% of people do their installations. It's just through a Helm install. So um, yes, there is. Awesome. If, you, if you just Google like Selden Core and the GitHub repo, it, it shows you straight on there that how to get the Helm charts. Great. Uh, the next question is from Yossi. Um, have you given a thought to storing the model as an OCI artifact so can be pulled from an OCI registry? Um, yes, so you can do that. Um, typically, what we wanted to do and, and where it's easier for data scientists to, to work with it is if they don't have to containerize their model already um, and they can just say, here's a model file, run with it. Um, but actually, you know, in reality, right, people end up, you know, building custom code. They often end up building their own inference servers if they have really, you know, bespoke needs. Um, and then, and and they also might have uh, some sort of CI CD process that's already been established that takes their model and builds it into a container. Um, so, so yes, we, um, you can just provide, you know, custom registries, etc. Um, and Selden Core can, can pick up your models from there and, and run them execute them. Great. Uh, and then we have one last question from Michael. Hi, are there supporting notes or something in GitHub? Um, yes, again, good question. Um, there are, yeah, there, 
we have a full like set of documentation um, probably like too detailed in some places um, so you know please flag something if it doesn't make sense um, the yeah the best place to get started so visit visit the github um, just search for seldom core you'll find it immediately um, and then from there dig into the documentation because there's loads of stuff on the docs um, but I would also strongly encourage you to join our Slack community. Uh, again, from the GitHub repo and from the docs, there's a link to join it. Um, and in there, you know, myself and, and the rest of the team who work on it and, and the rest of the community, you know, because the, the lovely thing about this is, right, we you know, built this open source project and kind of released it. And now we've got thousands of people all over the world using it and tons of people contribute back. They help answer each other's questions. Um, so you know, go on there and ask for help if you get stuck with anything. Um, we also run community calls and things, so you can you know keep up to date with the the new stuff that's coming out. Awesome! I think that's all the questions we had. Um, cool. I I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have an event tomorrow. So if you want to join in that event, I'm just going to put the link um in the chats but thank you very much ed um for your time and this session and we hope to see you again maybe in person at the reactor great yeah i'd, I'd love to come along i uh, hear you guys are opening up next week for for, for real again yes um, so yeah i'd love to come along and um, thank you very much for having me great thanks everybody um have a lovely evening and um, bye for now